Boker Tov, everybody. Okay, <clears throat> I don't have the same talent as you to not read off of something. So our uh, scholar in residence this week, weekend is Rabbi Lance Sussman. Many of us have had the privilege to hear him speak over the weekend. Today, Rabbi Sussman is here to talk about Escape from Nazi Germany, my family's story. <laughs> rabbi Lance Sussman is a native of Baltimore and currently serves as the Rabbi Emeritus of the Reform Congregation Knesset Israel of Elkins Park, Pennsylvania. He is also an American Jewish historian who has been published widely. He is currently working on a television show as well. I am so honored to welcome our cousin, Rabbi Lance Sussman, to speak with the Learning Lab and the congregation. Thank you, Mr. Rosen, Rick. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, like you just heard, I, I grew up actually in Pikesville and went to um, Wellwood Elementary School and Pikesville Senior High School. Graduated from there in 1972. Was anybody here among the students born in 1972? So, yes, adults for sure. But I think yeah, my ball, what, what, I can tell you that when I was growing up, this part of Baltimore County was farmland. They didn't have 795 and all these, it's all very new to me because I moved away after um, high school. I went to college out of town and never really came back. So this is like a whole different city and it's amazing. And I have four cousins with me today, which means I have to be extremely accurate in what I report to you, or you're going to hear somebody say, no, 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 that's 1935, 1934. So I'm going to try to be super, super um, accurate with you. So uh, the theme for the weekend that your, your synagogue picked uh, was on the theme of anti-Semitism. And Friday night at services, I talked about the long history of anti-Semitism from way, way back all over the world. And then yesterday um, for Shabbat morning, I talked about anti-Semitism in America. Who can define, um, if you're under 20 years old, I'm going to ask you, you have to be under 20 to answer this question, who can define for me what the word anti-Semitism means? Yes, sir. Hate against Jews. It's excellent. Hate against Jews. This concludes my lecture. You already know everything, and it'll be redundant. Okay, so it's hate against Jews and, and Judaism, and it's unfortunately, uh, oh, here, a fifth cousin is arriving. So, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very long phenomenon. Has anyone, in, and you can answer this or just keep your hands down, has anyone in your family ever experienced anti-Semitism? I have to be careful to look to my left because my ten and my right eye is better. How about you? You tell me what happened. It's a bad story, but I want to hear it anyway. I got it. And what's your dad's name? My dad's Larry Chapman. Okay. I, I had a classmate who, Keith Franz, I don't know if he, he, he ran for office. We went to school together. Did you say you had a report in your family? Hmm. So unfortunately today, um, compared to even 10 years ago or most, let's say 15 years ago when most of you were born, um, there's more anti-Semitism in the United States than there had been for a long time. It's, a, it's something like polls follow and trends. Uh, are any of you aware of a kind of headline story involving anti-Semitism in the United States? This is an unpleasant topic and uh, I don't mean to scare anyone. I'm here to discuss the current situation. So if, um, 
especially for the teachers. If anybody thinks we're going too dark, uh, let me know. We'll pull back. Can you think of something that's happened recently? Kanye West. Okay. So what what, what was anti-Semitic about Kanye West? Yeah, he, he said horrendous, really horrendous things. And um, what's particularly bad about what Kanye West said is who's listening to him? Who do you think is the group that's most impacted? Young but people. Young people. And they, they, they picked up on his comments, which were very hateful and very hurtful about our community and our, and our tradition. And I know I live in Philadelphia. I have grandchildren there. And um, they had trouble in their school system um, particularly in the middle school because kids were imitating Kanye West or, or is it yay I know he has some I, I would say boo but he he says yay I, he's like Heyman to me so boo okay and um, one of the things that's really concerning today is that your generation is is being hit with this bad stuff and they're Unfortunately, not everybody knows enough to say that's wrong, that that's bad, and they absorb it and then they they play it back. And, and we now have a, a parent committee that works with the schools um, to try and educate. And we took the older kids to the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Has anybody here been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington yet? Okay, so on this side a few so i think that's to come for most of you I, i'm pretty sure it's going to be on your your family agenda when i use the term, we defined anti-semitism perfect um when i use the term holocaust or in hebrew shoah what am i referring to what am i talking about yes sir Well, it has to do with Nazis, yes. What are we talking about? Jews being killed. About Jews being killed. Do you know when and where? Can you answer those kind of questions? Okay, let's try you. It starts in Germany. And about how long ago? I have to always remember to look left. <laughs> yes. How? So that's that's a a date that's right toward the beginning of this it's kind of the 30s and 40s so if it starts in the 30s uh, it's about starts about 90 years ago about 90 years ago which means that there are still people around who experienced it who experienced it directly they were probably pretty young that's certainly what I'm going to report on. Um, but we don't have many witnesses anymore because of age. You know, that they would all be in their 90s or hundreds. So uh, we don't have the living testimony. Like when I grew up in, in Pikesville, I heard reports directly from people who were in the Holocaust, who were victims of the the nazis or were let's say american soldiers who were involved in in liberating concentration camps the the clock runs and um we're running out we're down to a handful so you're really the last group that will ever hear directly from from a survivor uh, or a soldier um, and then the reports are going to come from what sometimes they call 2G and 3G. Anybody ever hear these expressions? And they're not, they're not the stuff with Wi-Fi. So 2G, and that's what I am, is second generation. So I didn't experience the Holocaust myself, but my mother and my grandmother um, did experience it, and I'm kind of like their echo chamber. And, and very interestingly, there's a phenomena today in this country that 3G, there's people in 3G who are speaking up and making this kind of their mission, 
to tell the story of, of the Holocaust. 3G would be third generation, would be third generation. So I have cousins here who would, I guess, be 3G, and now we're beginning to have even 4G. They're not direct in terms of the experience, but they heard it, and therefore it's personal. It becomes part of, of, of who you are. And so what I'm going to share with you is a 2G report, okay? I wasn't there. Please don't mix me up with a survivor because I'm not from that generation, but I grew up in a family in which there was a lot of Holocaust. There was a lot of memory and experience and, and artifacts and things like that um, that became a big part of my life. And I still feel it's important to get out there and, and talk about it. Um, so my nephew here, you didn't you do reports in school when you were growing up? Was it you who did it? And that's uh, Danny. And, and he went and he interviewed my mother, his, his grandmother, right? Um, to give reports. Okay, so if you're from such a family, it's really not unusual. It's not pleasant, but it's engaging. It's like something you can't let go. And one of the things that I learned about 1G, everybody got me when I say 1G, okay, is they didn't always like to talk about it. What's that? Yeah. So 1G um, hesitated for many years. Like my mother experienced some bad things and, and she didn't like to talk about it. It took until I guess she was a grandmother before she really started talking about it. And her mother, my grandmother, and we used German words in our, in our house because they came from, from Germany and we called her Oma, which is a, a German term. Uh, really didn't talk about it, but you knew it was it was kind of there. Okay, why do you think they didn't talk about it? We can talk about it. What do you think? Um, because it was very bad for them, and remembering it was painful. Right? It was painful. It's like you know. Sometimes bad things happen to us, and it's it's hard to talk about it. And sometimes you need time. You know, use the word process. You got to process it. You got to figure out how you deal with this information. So it was not unusual for for victims, survivors, to hold on to their stories. And the same thing, by the way, was true of soldiers. My father was a soldier in the American Army in World War II and saw terrible things and um, he didn't like to talk about it either until much later in life. And then all of a sudden, there was a change. And they said, you know, I'm getting old, and I, and I have to talk about it, because then nobody's going to know it. I can't just hold on to it forever. But it, it took decades, literally before my mother opened up about it. Here's how I learned. Because I was a kid growing up in Pikesville, I thought we were a normal family. I have relatives here to decide whether that's an accurate description of, of, of who we were um, growing up. And I was uh, playing in my Oma's house. Oma is, again, a German term for grandmother. And she had this beautiful piece of furniture in her, her dining room. It was like the buffet. And it was made from very beautiful white oak. And it was like a, it looked like a wave. It wasn't just a a box, but it was really nice. And it had an old fashioned skeleton key. Everybody seen that, you know, with the, it's kind of thick and all, no, no little board there to push buttons. Right. And, um, I, I explored, uh, I explored in her stuff. I should have asked for permission, but I was just curious. I was a kid and I don't remember how old 10, let's say. And, um, I got it in my head somehow that she, she had, a, a gem, a jewel that she was keeping in her dining room buffet. And I was going to find it and then the, and then the, give it to my 
family and they could sell it and we would live happily ever after because we had this huge gem that was hiding. And I have no idea where I got this stupid story from, but that's what, what Scott in my head and I'm, and I'm going through and there's all these old fashioned spoons and forks and serving trays and, and lo and behold, uh, there's a ring box. Anybody ever seen a, a ring box where it's kind of a upscale ring and it comes in a, and it, there was a ring box and it had German written on it, printed on it that I couldn't read. Uh, I can read a little German now, but then I couldn't read any German. And it had a, what was clearly a very old rubber band holding the box together. And I went, that's it. There's the gem. There's going to be a ruby in here or a diamond. And I did it. And I was so proud of myself. And I went to open it. And the rubber band was so old, it cracked. Anybody have that experience? Because it's too old and it loses its stretchiness, its elasticity. And I'm going, oh, now I'm, now I'm dead. <laughs> I ruined the, the rubber band on, on, the, on the gem box. And I opened it up. And I was very surprised by what I saw in there. It was not a gem. It was a curl of hair. It was a curl of hair. And, and I was going, what? There's a curl of hair in my grandmother's dining room? What, what could that possibly mean? So she had a little office in the back of her house. My mom and grandmother worked together for a, a business. And uh, she was in the office. I guess my mother wasn't there at the time. And I said, Oma, why do you have a curl of hair in a ring box in your dining room buffet? And she was not the kind of person who did a whole lot of talking. And she, she kind of looked at me and she goes, ask your mother. Well, my mother wasn't there, so. Um, I gave her the box. I don't remember what she did with it. Uh, it has reappeared, by the way. My my sister has it. Um, you know, your mom has found that box, and I just saw it back in January when I visited her in Florida. And um, my mom came, I guess, to get me, and I I said, "Why does Oma have a curl of hair?" in her buffet and she said it's a, it's not a good story but i'll tell you a little bit about it so um this is almost 60 years ago okay almost 60 years ago she explained to me the family came from germany i said well i know that and that she had to come to america and i said well i know that but what's it have to do with a curl of hair she said, well, I was a kid. I was 12 years old. I was 13 years old. And I had a best friend. And her name was Ruth. And before I left, before I left, we did something that girls used to do when I was growing up back in the 1930s, long time ago, as a sign of friendship we each cut a little curl off of our hair and exchanged them so that we would remember each other, okay? And um, that's Ruth's hair. Her name was Ruth Shapiro, and her father was the canner of the stad one synagogue in their town, and her, her dad was the Hazan, the, the canner, they lived in a small, um, my, my family lived in a small apartment building, which I have visited. I've gone back to Germany. And on the lower floor is where the Kenner family lived. So not only was, were they best friends, not only did they know each other in the context of synagogue, but they actually lived in the same apartment building. And they had a very tearful goodbye. And there was a little bit of correspondence. My mother made it to America, and I'll tell you that story, but Ruth and her family couldn't get out. And ultimately, they were deported to a country north 
east of Germany called Latvia. I don't know anybody ever heard of, like there's Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania, they're Baltic states. And they were deported by the Nazis and she died in a concentration camp. She, she didn't make it. So all that's left of that little girl is this curl. And, and that story of the curl of hair is how I began to learn about the Holocaust. And it immediately made it very personal because it was about my grandmother, it was about my mother, it was about my mother's best friend, who obviously I never met because she died uh, as a kid in a concentration camp. And all of a sudden, their story became my story. Okay. And here, here's the full version of the story. And Mr. Rosen or Rick or however is you're properly addressed here, just let me know on the clock uh, how we're doing. Because I can talk and talk and talk. So I don't want to, I don't want to slay you guys because I have a capacity to talk. So my family, our family, because there's a lot of us here today, luckily, um, lived in Germany for many generations. Can't tell you exactly how many I've tried to investigated and they lived in uh, the southern most province of Germany that's called Bavaria. Anybody ever hear of Bavaria? D does anybody know of an automobile that's made in Bavaria? Why would you say that, Cantor? Why would you say BMW is Bavaria? Because it's called Bavarian Motor Works. Okay, so you have a particularly well-educated and bright canner here. So, it's, and there's another company that makes cars in in Bavaria. No, and you and if I say Passat, you'll know what, or a bug or Volkswagen, Volkswagen which means the people's car. It means they're in another little town near there. They have a big giant factory. Mercedes is not in Bavaria. It's nearby. It's in another another state. With we would call state here. But let me tell you. Let me give you a digression about Mercedes. Okay, so you should know this. Um, where does the name Mercedes come from? You do good. See, I told you how good your your can. There, there was this man by the name of Yelenik, who was a a banker. And he met a guy named Mr. Benz, who said, I want to create the world's best luxury car. And this was in Central Europe and Germany and Austria. And um, Benz said to Yelenik, um, would you help finance a car company? And Mr. Yelenik said, I will on one condition, if you name your car after my daughter. So it's Mercedes Yelenik is the origin, who was a Jewish girl in Vienna, whose grandfather was the leading rabbi of the city. So there are all these strange connections. So our family lived in Bavaria, and their area was the center, an agricultural area where they grew hops. Anybody know what hops is? That's good that you don't know that. You shouldn't know that, but I'm going to ruin it, and hopefully your parents won't. Hops is not what bunnies do. Um, hops is an agricultural product that you use to make beer, central to making beer. And the town they lived in, about 50,000 people, was called Bomberg, and Bomberg was right in the center of the hops-growing region, and therefore it was kind of prosperous. Um, our family had really lived in little tiny villages near Bomberg, but before the First World War, way back in the early 1900s, my grandfather had moved from a village to Bomberg and then other members moved to, to Bomberg and they, and they moved to this community of about 50,000 people that had about a thousand Jewish families and had a very ancient um, history with the Jews had lived in Bomberg for a thousand years. They had lived there so long that 
behind the ark, and this is typical of Europe, there was a room behind the ark. And in the, the room behind the ark is where they stored all the Torah scrolls. That's where they, they stored them there because over time, people would move around and sometimes a family would own its own Torah scroll and it would be pretty unusual to keep that in your house. So you, you put it in the synagogue for safekeeping. And that, that synagogue had 51 Torah scrolls had 51 Torah scrolls. Guess how many of those Torah scrolls survived the Holocaust? Zero. One scrap from one Torah is, is all because they, they were burnt. And I'll explain how that happened. So my fam family lived in Bomberg, which is actually, from a physical point of view, a very beautiful city. It's on a river called the Regnets in the middle of a beautiful agricultural area the same way when you drive a little bit around here in this part of Baltimore County and their horse farms and it's this time of year everything is lush green and thing it's that's that's the kind of area um, that it looks like in in Bomberg and they live there and my grandfather operated he owned and operated a small factory and in their factory they made products from silk and it had a, it was a big factory building and then next to it was what they called the dye house uh, and they they were in the silk business which was part of the clothing business which was very typical of jewish families in in the old world and even here in, in in america my grandfather fought in the german army in world war one I. I even have a picture of him in his uniform he was a french interpreter so that if a Germans, German soldiers captured French, he would be an interpreter for the interrogation. And then after the war, he married my grandmother and he got into business and he was very, very successful. And they were very, very happy, as best I can tell. They, they were prosperous. They had a beautiful apartment. They had two children and th things were going along until a certain man was elected as the top person in the German government. And who, who was that? That was Hitler, Adolf Hitler. And he was the head of what political party? He was the head of the Nazi party. The word Nazi stands for national socialism. And the, it was a vicious, um, violent, political party and a big part to one of their top priorities was was anti-semitism that they thought it was the business of the german government to persecute and eventually get rid of all the jews they blamed the jews for everything and they started enacting laws they started enacting laws and one of the laws, it was called Nuremberg Laws, is that Jewish people and not Jewish people should not mix with one another. And what that meant was my mother, as a little girl, was removed from school. She was going to a public school. And the law now said that Jewish kids could not go to school with Gentile kids. So she was forced to leave school. So my grandparents enrolled my mother, her brother was still too young. They enrolled her in a Catholic school and the environment was changing in Germany. It became very, very rough. And in fact, everybody know what a sister or a nun is? Okay, the, the sisters in that school used to walk the Jewish children back and forth to their homes because it wasn't safe for Jewish kids anymore in the street. There were Nazis, there were Nazi youth organizations that prided themselves on taunting Jewish kids. And my mother and my uncle were both victims of that kind of taunting and violence and, and bullying. It's not like bullying here where you have a 
kid who's out of control and bullying. This was sponsored bullying. This was approved bullying. He couldn't run to the principal and say, Joe's bullying me. The principal would say, of course, he's bullying you. I told him to. Could you imagine being in a situation where the school said, go and bully Jewish kids? Well, that was that's what was happening in 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 uh, Germany. So they went to Catholic school for a little while. And then the authorities found out about it. And they said, you're still mixing Jews and non Jews and the Jewish kids cannot go to Catholic school anymore. So the Jewish community then organized a Jewish school for Jewish kids only and it met in the synagogue. It met in the synagogue and she went to that is the last school she went to in Germany because the government then passed another law and that said that Jewish kids cannot go to school period no school for Jewish kids and it was at that point that my grandparents my Oma and my Opa made the decision that they had to send my mother away because she couldn't get an education in Germany. My grandfather had a, a brother who had come to the United States after World War I. He too had been a German soldier and came here and married and did well. And he said he would take my mother on if they would just send her. And in January, as best I know, because the, as we find old letters and things in the family things keep changing a little bit but somewhere around january of 1938 um, they were able to make arrangements to send my mother to america to prepare her for it they had a special suitcase made and things like that and then they they made this decision that she couldn't, they didn't have credit cards in those days. And you should never travel if you don't have some kind of money with you because you don't know, you might need some money when you, you travel. So they, they came up with a plan that at night when the factory was closed, they would take spools that the thread, the silk would be on and they would wrap money, German money around the axle of the empty spool and then hand wind the thread around the money okay and they and that way they were able to make sure that my mother age 12 13 would have some resources when she was traveling and she was told if people asked why would a kid be carrying spools that her answer was her father was a businessman and these were samples these were samples of his products and that and then she would have have a story so my my grandfather accompanied my mother um, as far as england they left germany crossed europe crossed the channel went to england and um, they stayed in a hotel the night before the, the boat was to sail to New York. And lo and behold, when um, my mother woke up on the day of her, her trip to America, my grandfather wasn't there. Why do you think he left? What's that? Okay. What's that? Want to repeat your real loud? He didn't, he didn't want the money. I can guarantee you it was the last thing he was worried about. He, 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 it's not who he wanted to be with. It was too difficult. It was too difficult to say goodbye, is my guess, because I don't have a letter confirming it. So in my imagination, I'm saying to myself, like, I'm a dad, I'm a grandpa. How do you say goodbye to your child? Right. How do you know if you're ever going to see them again? Because he didn't have permission to leave. And all the laws were making it more and more difficult for him to support his family and his kids couldn't go to school. And here he has 
typical 12, 13 year old girl, and he's sending her away on, on an ocean liner by herself, not knowing if they would ever, and he couldn't, I don't think he could take it. So she had instructions, she had her luggage, and she went to the boat, and they had arranged that a slightly older girl, I can't figure it out, somewhere between 15 and 17, would be her travel com uh, companion. And they sailed to New York, where my mother was received by, uh, where my mother was received by um, her uncle and her aunt, and she stayed with them for one year. Okay, what? And she learned to speak English. And the relatives who took care of her for the year um, did not allow her to speak any German, and they made her practice her English. And as a result, my mother never had an accent. Some of her cousins who also escaped had pretty heavy German accents, but she really didn't have a German accent. In November of 1938, a terrible event took place in Germany called Kristallnacht. Anybody ever hear of Kristallnacht from November 8, 9, 10? Well, what happened in, oh yeah, you know, Exactly, it's the night of the broken glass. Actually in Germany today, they call it the pogrom of November, the November pogrom. They no longer use the term Kristallnacht. And we're still using it here, but the Germans decided it's too soft. Crystal sounds nice. So they've changed it to pogrom, but it was a pogrom. It was a riot against the Jews. Um, and almost every, not every, but almost every, synagogue in Germany was burned to the ground on Kristallnacht because the Nazis did not want to see symbols of Judaism. So they wanted to get rid of the symbols and in their heads they were thinking, and then we're going to get rid of these people or whatever they are as well. So there was this terrible pogrom and the synagogue in Bamberg, which was beautiful, big old stone synagogue, um, Jews had lived there for a thousand years, 51 Torah scrolls, was burned to the ground. It was, it was burned to the ground and um, it, the building actually at one point collapsed and the dome fell on the ground and it, it was a terrible situ situation. The leading member of the Jewish community um, was a man named Willie Lessing. He had been on the city council before the Nazis came in and he ran to the synagogue and he begged the German rioters not uh, to leave. He said, just give me one Torah scroll. I want one Torah scroll. And you know what they did to him? They beat him with iron, stick, iron rods. And a couple of days later, he died from it. And today, the main street in Bamberg is, is actually Willy Lessing Street, Strasse in, in, in uh, Germany. My grandfather, along with all the other Jewish men, in Bamberg were arrested on Kristallnacht. Um, the, the government said the Jews had provoked this action and the Gestapo came and took him and put him in jail. And some of the uh, people were then also deported to the closest concentration camp, which was in Munich, about 100 miles away, called Dachau. And we actually lost a member of our family, died just after Kristallnacht in Dachau because he went to the bathroom without permission. He did not have permission to go pee. His name was Herman Fuld and he was shot and he was executed. And a few years ago, I actually found um, a report on the trial of the guard who, who shot him, who was from a nearby, uh, a nearby um, village. So my grandfather was in jail. My mother was in New York, um, and they knew something bad was coming. They were making plans um, to try to get out of Germany. It was very, very difficult to leave Germany. It was very difficult to find anywhere to go, um, but they needed help because they couldn't do it alone. And there's not a lot of good parts to my story, but this is a good part. They had a woman who used to work in their home. Her name was Maria Maria. And she was a, like a cleaning lady and she was not educated. She could barely read. Um, and in the night of the pogrom of the riot against the Jews, 
she went to my grandparents' apartment and she said, what can I do to help you? And as best I know the story, I have no documented proof of it. Um, they had put some money aside, cash, to bribe a guard. And she went to the jail, which was controlled by the German secret police called the Gestapo. And she bribed a guard. And my grandfather was able to get out from a back door. He went home. They had a plan. They had a a car with a driver that took them to Stuttgart, which is, by the way, near where the Mercedes are made. And uh, from there had transportation uh, to Holland and from Holland. Uh, and they lived in a house actually one block from where Anne Frank was living and later hiding. And then were able to get on a, on a boat and 12 months, 12 months after my mother had gone to New York. They got to New York too, okay? Uh, my mother and her hosts went to the dock. Everything was by boat then. You didn't fly across the Atlantic. It wasn't really possible yet. And um, they had a fight. They had a fight because my mother wanted to stay with her parents, okay? but. Her aunt and uncle said they had been taking care of her and they had a beautiful apartment in Central Park West in New York City and that my grandfather and family had to stay in a low level hotel for refugees. And Aunt Rose said, well, look, Frida is not going to some flea house hotel. She's staying with me. And my mother, 13 years old, said, no, I'm not. I'm staying with my parents because I haven't, and they're my parents, and you've taken care of me, but you're my aunt and you're not my mother. So what do you think? Was she right? Or, or Aunt Rose said she was not being grateful. What do you think was the right thing? Tough human situation, right? Aunt Sandy, Miss my aunt. Yeah. She smacked her hand down and said, I'm not staying here, not one more minute. Okay. And she was gone. Now, of course, I knew my mom, and I totally believe that version of the, of the story. So she stayed with her parents, and the family was reunited. I have one more part of the story, and then I want to know if you have questions or comments, and you've been very good listening, actually, for a very long time, so I appreciate that. No sooner than my grandparents were able to reestablish themselves and my grandfather got himself a job, family started functioning again as a complete family, he decided he owed it to people they had left behind in Germany to rescue them. So he devoted the next few years to rescue. This was the end of 38, the beginning of 39. And he had a little window there because once the United States was in the war, you weren't going to have civilian rescue anymore. So for about two years, he worked on rescue and he did something that I think looking backwards was completely crazy, but very heroic. He went back to Germany. He went back to Germany to get people out his friends, neighbors, uh, the, our relatives were in pretty good shape because we had connections. We're very unusual and lucky as a family. How many people do you think my grandfather rescued? 10,000, 10, I, I wish. Quite a, few. Quite a few, a little more cautious. Left side. 37 people exactly. I think he was trying to rescue about 12. And guess how many he got out of those 12? Zero, none. And we have the paperwork. And um, since my mother passed away, my sister has become like the archivist of our family and tons of paperwork that I need to go through, but I've read some of it. And there, there were problems everywhere. First of all, of course, the Germans weren't cooperating. The American government was not cooperating. 
And people here, even in the Jewish community, it's a very important lesson for us and for you as the rising generation in the community to, to know this, that they were too afraid to help. There were too many risks and he couldn't get any cooperation. Uh, and none of those people, including Ruth Shapiro's family, were able to get out. They begged, knocked on doors, wrote letters to the government. Um, nothing, nothing worked. Nothing, nothing worked, okay? And it was, it's all part of this terrible tragedy called the Holocaust. So eventually, you know, America wins the war, the Allies win the war, they rebuild their, their lives, and um, life went on. Uh, I decided um, early in my career as a rabbi that I, I wanted to, and this will be my last report, and then we'll talk. Uh, I wanted to see where my mother and her family were from. My aunt had already done it. Yep, me and Kurt had already been to Europe, I think, before me. And I went to Bomberg, and um, I went to the factory, which was still there. This was 1992. It was abandoned, and it had a hole in the roof because during the war, an American bomber had dropped a bomb uh, on, on the factory, uh, but it didn't explode. So it made a hole and uh, it didn't blow up. So the, the building was still there. There were zero Jewish people left in Bomberg of a thousand, a zero were left in the community. The community still owned their building, but they had nobody to put in it. So the authorities assigned the building to what was called the Bavarian Jewish Council. So I, I entered this building. I probably didn't have permission to do so. Uh, and it was mostly empty. And I, I got into the warehouse section and guess what I found on shelves in the warehouse section? Spools of red silk thread. They, they were you know, probably manufactured slightly after the war, but nevertheless authentic. Uh, from the family. And I remember bringing them home and family came over to hear my report and I put the spools on the table and it was the most silent silence I'd ever heard in my life. People were just stunned that that evidence of the experience was still there. Fast forward about another 20 years, Jewish people begin immigrating back to Germany. And all of a sudden, Bomberg, which had a thousand years of Jewish life, and then it was completely destroyed. And now all of a sudden, Jewish people are moving back there again, mostly from Russia. But because this is a beer growing area, Jews from all over the world, particularly Israel, were going to Bomberg to learn how to make beer. So it became an attractive place. And there were all many, almost as many Jews again in Bomberg as before Hitler. There was close to a thousand, okay? And they needed a synagogue. They needed a Jewish community center. And the Bavarian Jewish Council said, well, we own a building. It's the, our, the family name, it was Saki. Uh, we have the old Saki factory. Why don't we fix it? So I told my mom, my sister, my aunt, and, and, and said, who, who wants to go with me? They're gonna have a ceremony for Opa's factory that is going to become the new synagogue in Bomberg. And a bunch of us went and I took members of my synagogue and it was one of the best experiences I ever had in my whole life. We were received like heroes. They were so happy they were going to get a synagogue. I joined the synagogue. I get their newsletter and the mail from, from, from Germany today. And today it is a beautiful, thriving synagogue with a Hebrew school and there's a new chapter. Okay. So it all, it all, it all came around. Although there are, there's nobody there now who was there before. It's a whole new population. So that's my report. Okay. And, uh, I don't know the exact schedule for school this morning, but I hope we have time. We have five, five, ten minutes. 
time for your questions. You've been very attentive. I appreciate your good manners, but I'm curious as to how you react to our story. Yes, please. There, there, uh, what is a concentration camp? Let's let's start with that. So the Nazis develop a program to get rid of all the Jews, and I mean get rid of them forever. Uh, they have a system of detention centers or prisons where Jews were and others, political dissidents, um, homosexuals, all types of people that they didn't like, and they sent them to these concentration camps, and there were thousands of them. There was a whole system, very small places, bigger places, and then as part of their system, there were a dozen so or so places that were actually called death camps, where that's where the killing took place that aspect of the Holocaust. So the, the, what, the first and nearest of the major concentration camps to Bomberg was in the city of Munich, which is the home of BMW, by the way. And that camp is called Dachau, and it's still there, and it's very heavily visited by tourists to this day. So th that's what a concentration camp. In German, the word for camp is Lager. So in, in Germany, you'll see a sign, it'll have a K and an L, concentration lager, and that means there's a memorials, memorial site, and they're, they're actually all over Europe. Yes? Um, Want to repeat for me, teacher? No. So, I was born in 1954, and the story I told you is mostly between 1935 and 1945, so it was kind of 10 years before I was born. But I think my birth, I want to take a little credit, was very important because they had escaped from Germany or they would have perished there, and I was kind of proof that the family was going to go on. And then my other cousins came along and you know, slowly we rebuilt what is actually a very, very small family, but we got out. I mean, you know, in Poland, 91% of the Jews were murdered and there's very few Jews left from, from Poland. German Jews had a little longer time to get out, so there's more of them. Uh, so I, I was not witness. I remember I used the expression, I am 2G. I'm not 1G, I'm 2G and I'm reporting to you as 2G. Ma'am, please. They sent them, the question is, why did they send them to Latvia? And I don't know specifically, but, um, the Jews in Bomberg that were left were rounded up. There had been a Jewish social club. We don't really have anything like that in this country. Um, and they were rounded up and put in, in this um, social club. And then eventually from there, they were deported. And why they deported them um, to Latvia, I can't, I can't explain. What's it? Latvia, uh, Riga was a heavily German-speaking city. Yes. Culturally. So you could deport people to Latvia while they were being waited to figure out what to do with the Jews. Very good. Uh, again, I'm out of Germany. I'm out of Germany. Right. To Riga, because at least they spoke the same language. Yeah, there's... Promptly... Right. There were many, many, and these countries, even like Lithuania that speaks Lithuanian, there were whole regions of German-speaking people that Germany was reclaiming. They wanted what they called the Greater Reich. That would make a lot of sense. Thank you. I didn't put that together. So, Tadarabha. Um, since the theme of our weekend has been anti-Semitism, I'll just briefly tell a little bit related to my family story, and that is uh, my grandfather was killed in Dachau prior to Crystal Light. My mother and my grandmother got out, and my great grandmother eventually got out of our camp here. I'm not sure how, but um, I, I don't, you heard of Stolperstein, right? So for the children, there's a, a little brass plate that has been placed in front of where people live if they perished in the Holocaust, or in some cases if they had to escape. So I have been um, doing some research for my family 
there is, um, thanks to Sherry Stern, who's a member here, who connected me with some people, there is um, a woman who is sponsoring and paying for a Stockerstein for my, to be placed in front of my great parents' mm. home. I'm hoping it's going to happen like within the next year. So the German, the Germans are really trying hard to make up for the sins of their previous generation. And um, mm. I was going to pay for the Stockerstein. They weren't talking about a lot of money, but they feel very strongly that the surviving family members should not yeah. pay for it. And that the um, city where my grandparents live, where my father lived, was Carlsville. And that city is not paying for it. Right. Other cities are. Yeah. I don't remember one in front of their place the last time I was there. Stolperstein is a German word that means tripping stone. And the idea is that uh, every house where there was a Jewish family should have a marker. And you shouldn't, as a regular citizen today in Germany, be able to walk by it as if nothing had happened. You should be tripped up by your memory. So there was an artist who came up with this concept of Stolperstein, and there are tens of thousands of them. They usually start with the German words, here wohnen, here lives, here dwelled this family. And it would say whether they escaped or whether they were killed. If they were killed in Auschwitz, it would be there. So there are such memorials in Germany. Not all the places like Austria have done the same thing. Germany, especially what had been West Germany, has been better at that than some of the other places. That's very important. Thank you for Stolperstein. Any, any other questions? Any other questions or reactions? Also adults, your turn. Are we good? So I hope you learned something. Ah, was there another hand? Yes, I'm sorry, dear. So the question is, how did they deal with it? And I might call for some family backup. Um, like, like I said, for, for years, um, they didn't, what's that? Less that, fine, thanks, doctor. Um, for years, they didn't talk about it. Um, there was, then they did once they hit their 60s or 70s, um, they talked about it quietly. Um, there was no bragging in the sense, I'm a survivor. You know, nobody ever acted like that. Um, when my mother was very, very old, I went to a Yom HaShoah program with her in, in Miami. I went, it was my, I was visiting my sister and my mother, and we went to this big outdoor program and it was a commemoration of the Holocaust and she became very angry and agitated. And it's the only time I ever saw any kind of emotional reaction. And she, she was kind of saying to herself, they weren't there. They didn't know what happened. They don't know how bad it was. That was the only indication I ever got. I, but they kept it to themselves and they, they were very modest. There was a little tension in the survivor community between people who escaped let's say Germany in 38, 39, and those who survived concentration camps and were liberated in 45, if they were the same class of people or they have a different status, kind of a sophisticated distinction. But today, I think that has disappeared. And if you were a Jew in Europe and you survived and you were still around, that you were included. But for years, there was some, some tension. But they didn't want to talk about things like that. I think what they wanted was to be normal. I think they wanted to be normal. Um, in our family, they very quickly reattached themselves to synagogue life. And that I think that helped provide some continuity. And Sandy. Say it again, please. We always said we had to keep our passport. Ah, oh, yeah. Be ready to run. Exactly. Yeah, be ready to run. It came out of all. Yeah. And how they even had the wherewithal to know. I mean, if you stop and think today that if our country were involved in something like this, 
Right. Yeah. Right. I, I also heard, because I developed a tradition of putting up American flag in front of my house for the 4th of July, that my grandfather, Max Sack, he always flew a flag in front of his, he was very grateful to have made it here. So I think we are at the end of our time. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for being good listeners. I hope you learned something.